Um, why do people come to see a psychologist? What is it all about? Well, we can't go into the full uh, protocol of why people come, but you know, people come because they have problems or concerns, a difficult child, a, a, a marriage in trouble, um, an aging parent, financial problems, all sorts of things. And when you really get into the stories that people tell once they're in the treatment room, a lot of the topics are universal and they repeat themselves and they're just as dramatic as the most dramatic fiction, betrayal, lust, Facebook issues now that there's social media, researching people from the past, sometimes that's great, sometimes it's a little dangerous. Uh, romance, the beginnings of romance, the endings of romance, spiritual guidance, friendship. Friendship at different stages of life is so crucial, and fidelity, infidelity, boredom, so after all these years of listening to people's stories, which of course are completely confidential, um, I think that as I've looked for ways to present my material and to get people thinking about these major issues that we face in life, how do I do it in new ways and creative ways that maybe are fun, and I have fun doing them too. My girlfriend, Susan Wiener, she and I wrote the plot for a movie. We didn't even start with a book. We had a tuna fish sandwich, and we spent hours in a restaurant, and before we knew it, we had, we had the movie planned. I decided one day that I was going to take some of the themes and just start to work on them that we had come up with which involved uh, romance, friendship, mysticism, terrorism, mystery, a mystery woman uh, who provides a kind of guru experience to women, and all these sorts of things. And we had decided that wouldn't the film be fun if it were in Jerusalem? You know, because then we'll get to go there and everything. And <laughs> I think that when things come alive, when the written word comes alive from page to stage, it changes profoundly what, an, what you're able to get out of it. The two main characters, Natalie and Maggie, are not going to just act in the few scenes we're presenting to you, but they will stay in character. They are here as our guests and they will be Natalie and Maggie as you ask them questions. Maggie, have you told me all your secrets? Ah, oh, who cares? <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Have you told me all of yours? I think so. You're the only person on earth who knows almost as much about me as I do. And maybe you know even more because you can see me from the outside in and, and I can only see out. Okay, you just lost me there. Um, remember, I majored in dating and getting C's while you chose psychology as your major. Anyway, I'm thinking of one small secret that maybe I didn't tell you. What? Sometimes I feel bored with David. I mean, I feel like something is missing from my life. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe a, a kind of energy. I think so, but sometimes our, our relationship feels like a, a two-day-old bottle of soda pop. Did you ever cheat on him? No. Are you crazy? Okay. Uh, Don't get angry with me. 
I almost cheated too, but, well not too, but my husband is completely different. He didn't have my best interests at heart, and David has your back. You're right, he does. Maybe I'm just looking for something that has nothing to do with David. Something that feels like it's coming from the outside, but it's really coming from within me. All right, that's, I don't know, too profound again. Come down to earth and give me an example of what you mean. Well, for example, the way we both felt the other night at, at Mrs. Tannenbaum's house, when everyone was together and joyous and fulfilled and happy and unburdened, it was just wonderful. Yeah, you know, I, I felt that too. I got it. It was alive, but not anxious. Involved and delighted and moved, but not sad. Maggie, you should be the psychologist. And you don't even have a degree. Uh, I just, I don't want to keep this feeling though forever. I want that feeling that we had at, at the home like that. Wouldn't you like to have that as well? Yes, yes, yes. Well, they say, you know, after a year, after a divorce, you have to wait and, and start dating. So I did start dating after a year, and I met um, this wonderful gentleman, Gary, who's a uh, detective in White Plains, and he's really nice. And so I have feelings for him, and not that serious, but we're. He's a keeper. She should hold on to him. Okay. Now she likes him. Compared to her husband, he was. He was an abusive kind of guy. Natalie, you had some right. feelings and thoughts about her husband over the years. Oh, she deserved much better. Uh, she, you know, she's the kind of person that always wants to work things out, thinking that maybe, you know, I guess she thought that maybe she could change him and, you know, but um, he just really didn't understand her feelings about things and not a very good communicator. So I'm very happy that she's moved on. Um, touching those big giant stones. She's decided not to pray since it might be too risky. She closes her eyes instead and just lets her hands move smoothly over the st stones. They're warm and smooth to the touch. She breathes slowly and she stands there quietly. Suddenly, she becomes aware of a small piece of paper that she's accidentally removed from between the stones she was touching. What are you doing? Did you just take that paper out of the wall? It feels like it's something that was meant for me to read. I, I don't... I didn't have the words, but until I actually and accidentally touched someone else's prayer, it felt like my own. Well, what did it say? Please, God, to mine own self, be true, Liz. Okay, I like that. I wonder who Liz is and what happened to her. Well, don't you feel like we entered someone else's world? Yes, but the odd thing is, her world feels like my world. It's just so strange. Hi, Sarah said that prayer is an amazing opportunity to connect with God, and somehow we're all connected. Oh, look, I, I can't concentrate on the big stuff right now. I, I'm just trying to hold on to my life and make some sense of it. Let's go. I'm cold. <laughs> some psychologists do are. Right? <laughs> write down all the things that made you fall in love with David and all the wonderful things about him and the things that you enjoyed when you were younger and some passion that you have that maybe you could share a uh, dancing class or whatever it is that you like to do instead of, don't go meet that other guy. I, I, I think that's a great idea. I think that's a great idea. Sometimes David can be a little, a little 
stayed, and he doesn't always open up to fun things. And but but I should be more creative. I think that's a, a good suggestion. But do you think you'll really do it? I I will I I will, but I I still feel pure. Uh, nothing's going to happen. We're going on a double date. Maggie will be with me. D um, Jack is bringing a friend. So it's going to be very safe. I won't be alone with him. Jack and Natalie walk down a dark alley. There's a familiar stance between them, with his arm lightly around her shoulder. Natalie, I must talk to you. Natalie looks surprised, but clearly still connected to him. Don't you understand? Don't you feel what I feel? He pulls her toward him, grasps her face in his hand, and gently kisses her, ever so lightly on the lips, just a touch. The very lightness set her on fire. It was as if there had been an explosion on Ben Yehuda Street. Had he started by pushing his way into her mouth, she would have fought back and then put off. But the gentleness of his first kiss made her urge come alive, like an active volcano ready to erupt. I missed you so much. The next kiss was firmer and a little longer. Again, he retreated. Just enough for the volcano to erupt a little more. Do you think I forgot our love? Nothing else has come close to it. The third kiss had pressure and staying power. <laughs> and she yielded. Her mouth opened, and she gave permission to the only tongue that has ever touched the inside of her mouth, aside from David's, in the past 25 years. She didn't resist as Jack's arms caressed her back and moved even lower. <laughs> the time came to a halt. The past had moved forward, and all her cells were determined to stay in the present moment. She was very, very hungry. Much hungrier than she'd ever realized a woman could be. I have never forgotten you, and I never will. <coughs> Natalie pushed herself away, but not completely. That would be too painful. Jack. She pushed herself away. You, you seem to forget that I married, and, and so are you. What you remember is from a, a long, long time ago. Sometimes things are just meant to be. Anyway, my, my marriage isn't good. Natalie slowly came back to Earth. How many millions of times had women heard a line like that? How many women became the mistress of a man in a bad marriage? Well, my marriage is good. We have to stop. He's the youngest of four boys, and two of his brothers still live in India, in Mumbai. They go to the synagogue there, and they keep kosher. Can you believe that? But between them, they have nine children. Wow. And his older brother also lives in England. Oh. He's a musician, and he plays for the London Symphony. He said that he didn't have children, but he was married for 10 years to a very bright woman from India, whom he actually met in London. She had a big job and a bank and a doctorate in economics. She wasn't Jewish, and he didn't care, but he fought back and realized that one of their conflicts was religion. And he became more interested in Judaism than she found, and she found it boring. So after a while, it seemed like they didn't agree on anything anymore, even food. He's a vegetarian, and she loves chicken vindaloo. You should have seen how intently he listened in my uh, to my stories about my marriage. I mean, his face was, it was so responsive and caring. And every time I looked into those deep brown eyes, I melted a little more. And when I told him how my ex is giving a two-carat diamond to that bitch secretary he's engaged to, he looked like, I mean, he was going to cry. No man has ever shown such sincere interest in me before. Then, before I knew it, I was sitting there without my blouse on. Ooh. <laughs> Who knew? Um, we lay down on giant pillows, and things happen very fast, and then they happen very slowly. Oh, so it was wonderful. I get that. And you're, and you're coming back with us. Yes, yes, I, I am leaving. Raji and I will write, and we'll Skype with each other. Now, 
but what about Gary? Remember you left him home in New York and he'll be waiting for you. I'll see, we'll see. I, I still like Gary, but let's see how things settle once we're back. I know I can't talk straight or think straight yet and I'm too <laughs> over the top for the moment, but even I know there's a part of me that realizes that it would be easier in the long run to get involved with Gary. Raji means a complete change of everything. I'm not sure I'm ready to leave Manhattan and live between London and Jerusalem, but we don't have to decide that right now. <coughs> Today, we can just flow. And what are you going to do, my dear? Well, actually what I did was I ended up going to the mikvah, and it was fabulous. I, it was such a spiritual experience, and I felt so much closer to God after having experienced that, and also to David. Um, and the funny thing is, when I came home, David had a little treat. <laughs> wow. Oh, only David had a treat? I guess myself, too. It was, it was the best thing ever. I think I had a sense of being renewed. And was there something that Chaya Sira had shared with you, a concept that helped bring everything together? Well, first of all, I was honest with her, and I told her about what happened with Jack. And she helped me realize that it's really David that's my soulmate. See, and I, I told you. Yeah. I, I guess I, I needed to get there, but somehow the experience at the mikvah, the beauty of it, helped me appreciate the beauty of of what I feel with my husband.